Sandy Blythe. Hey, folks. Come on down. Welcome back. Hope you all have had a great first day of Faculty Summit. Um, I should thank, uh, of course, first and foremost, the uh, speakers from our breakout sessions, uh, especially our university partners who presented with us. I thought the topics were top notch and uh, I very much appreciate all of the speakers for the evident uh, care and effort that they put into uh, their presentations there. So thank you to all of the breakout speakers. Uh, we've got more to come. I'm particularly excited about the next topic. Um, as I said this morning, I thought there was an amazing canvas of opportunity in systems research, and it's not just for great research and instruction. I think there's an opportunity for entrepreneurship as well. And uh, we've got a panel of people who have had success in translating uh, their systems research into entrepreneurial success. And I'm very pleased to introduce our first panelist from Microsoft Research, uh, Ranveer Chandra. Ranveer has uh, a career at Microsoft as a principal researcher. He's uh, received himself over 85 patents here in the US and more on the way. Uh, he's been running battery projects and a TV white spaces project. He's probably best known at the moment for running a project called Farm Beats, which is really an internal startup at Microsoft. It started as a research project in IoT for digital uh, agronomy and has moved now out into uh, customer's hands and is making a difference in reducing the cost and increasing the viability of agriculture as we uh, face a future of increasing scarcity. He's uh, been well recognized, published in a number of venues, uh, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal. He's an MIT uh, TR35, or the Technology Review TR35 winner as a top innovator. And so really has a lot to say about entrepreneurship along with his two uh, co-panelists. So with that, let me introduce Ranveer. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you all for coming. Today we have an exciting 35 minutes where we have uh, two distinguished panelists. We'll be discussing about systems research and entrepreneurship. The two distinguished uh, professors we have, one is Don Song from UC Berkeley and Matei from Stanford University. Welcome, Don. <laughs> so both uh, Don and Matei are uh, very well-known faculty. They have both, uh, Don is a professor at UC Berkeley. She's, uh, her papers are very well cited. In addition to that, she's also received multiple awards, the MacArthur Fellowship, the Sloan Fellowship, the MIT TR35 Award, and the list goes on and on. I won't go there. For this session, what's exciting is that she's done multiple startups, uh, Insider Security sold to FireEye, the other one, Menlo Security, and the third one, which she's doing right now, is on Oasis Labs. She does research in security, blockchain, machine learning, AI, cloud, everything systems. Then <laughs> Matei from Stanford University. Uh, Matei is a uh, young faculty there. He's already done amazing work. His PhD thesis was among the best I've read in recent times, which was on Apache, uh, this, was, this led Apache Spark, which led to Databricks. So he released his code, which was done as part of the PhD thesis, which received the ACM Best Dissertation Award. This was released as open source. Since then, he's actually founded the startup, which is doing super well, which, raised, which has raised over $200, $200 million and has several customers. And Azure, it's on Azure as well. It's one of, uh, we co sign along with uh, Databricks. So welcome again for this exciting discussion. So one of the things as systems researchers we uh, run into is all of us who do research want to build systems that is used by a lot of people. We want it to scale out. We want it to be adopted out there in the wild. There are multiple ways to do that, right? All of us at some point think that, hey, you know what? It's ready. We are ready to take this out. And the few ways you can actually take it out to multiple people is either you can release it as open source. Uh, my advisor, Ken Berman, had recently written a blog on that. Why do you, how do you, when should you open source your, your solutions? Either open source or you could license it out. There are various faculty who've done very well by licensing out the technology, like Guri Sohi from uh, Wisconsin, or the third, which both of you have done, which is to do a startup. So when did you, what made you decide, Dawn, first I'll ask you this question, since you've done one startup after another. When, when did you decide that it was, you were ready to do a startup, and why a startup? Why not license it out or put your code out as open source? Mm -hmm. 
um, I think uh, so. Different researchers have different preferences, and for me, I I would feel that uh, as a researcher, not only that I want to build new technologies, I'm really excited about the innovation uh, from the technical perspective, and also at the same time, I feel. Uh, as a researcher, often we do have the responsibility to take our creations, our new technologies into the real world to help change the world, to help improve the world. And with that, I think I uh, enjoy the process of seeing uh, and also the, the journey of taking the technology that we develop in the lab and actually into the real world to see it. Uh, also, that's a great way as a first hand uh, you can see uh, what needs to be improved in the technology that you have developed mm -hmm. and how to make it even better. And I think all these are great reasons to actually do it firsthand. And also, as technology innovators, oftentimes you are the one who actually understands the technology best, and hence you know what's the best way to adjust and adapt to the real world use cases and to find the best product market fit. No, this is a this is a good answer. This is something which propels me as well, doing previously with TV White Spaces or with FarmBeat. Success is not just writing a paper, it's actually getting it out into the hands of everyone. This is a different principle. For some faculty, it could just be, I published a paper, someone will pick it up. So, Matei, to you, so you've mm -hmm. done both. You've released your code as open source, which has been a big hit, and mm -hmm. you're also doing a startup, which is another big success. So how did you decide for each one of them which route to go, mm -hmm. and would your decision have changed? Like with, with Spark, would you still have released it as open source if back then you knew that you were doing mm -hmm. a startup? Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, so um, in general, so releasing software as open source from research is uh, is a great way to see you know whether people can actually use it and uh, and uh, also engage with early users who are willing to try it out and give you feedback. So so that was great. I think um, for us, one one reason to to start a company around it was actually just to push it to the next level. So Apache Spark already had uh, a bunch of early users when you know when we decided to start the company and it had some traction, people were excited about it, but in a university, you have limited resources uh, to work on it. So uh, we felt that as a company, we could actually uh, you know, invest a lot more in it, push it to the next level, and, and tackle a whole new uh, set of problems with it. And that's exactly what happened. Actually, since we uh, started the company, both you know, the, what's in the software, like the functionality, the features, uh, have grown tremendously, and also the developer community has grown tremendously. And it's definitely partly because the company spent a lot of time making sure it's super easy for people to use and to be successful with. So basically what you're saying is depending on your idea, depending on what you're doing, you mm -hmm. might want in some cases to open source it. Yeah. To, to even, for example, you created courses around some of these, right? Yeah. And you had yeah. so many people trained mm -hmm. to use Apache Spark and yeah, that exactly. helped lead to the success of Databricks. Yeah, that's the thing the company did to, to promote it and to help people uh, use it. But it, it it is partly a matter of scale, as I said, and it depends on the software. I mean, this was, you know, a, basically a distributed computing platform and standard library. You know, every data processing algorithm you, you want to use, giving you a distributed version of it. That's a pretty big effort. There are some other efforts where maybe you just build a small open source project and it goes that way. Right. No, that's, um, a, yeah. that's a good point. So the other question which is related to this is, how did you do the transition once you wanted to do the startup? How did you go about doing it? Did you, like, in some cases, some academics are good at doing research. Do you hire someone from outside to be the CEO, run with it? Do you do it yourself? Do you, how do you build a team? At what point, because you still have students, at what point do you decide to take it out versus just keep still doing research on top, building something solid, and how do you take it out? How do you how do you make it into a startup? When do you incorporate? When do you build a startup out of it? Don, why don't you start with three experiences? You had <laughs> one after another. You could start with uh, the first one, okay. Insight or Security. Yeah, given that I've done two and now I'm doing the third, so I do have a very um, broad experience yeah. uh, uh, in, right, in this regard. Uh, so in terms of whether we should hire outside CEO, uh, or bring outside CEO, or whether we should do it ourselves. Um, so in my case, actually, we've done both. So my first, for my first company, as well as the third company, the one that I'm doing right now, Oasis Labs, so I, I'm the CEO, the founder and CEO. And for the second company, Mellon Security, so that one we actually have a great CEO who has been running it from very early on. And I think in different cases, they actually both have worked out really well. 
Um, so in the first case and also for the third one, so essentially these are technologies. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, one thing is that for, for technologies, you have, as we develop technologies, then besides the technology side, we also really, the biggest question is to find product market fit. And also the CEO's job needs, besides you know, hiring and raising money is to have the, to be able to carry out the overall vision, the direction for the company. So oftentimes it's a bit tricky for outside CEO who don't understand the technology well enough to actually lead the vision and also to even find the good product market fits because they may not know the technology enough to be able to quickly yeah. figure out yeah. what may be the best product market, market fit. So in the first case and the third case, um, so I was able to, uh, I was CEO and, and it was difficult to, I mean, I was happy to do it and also it's hard to find other CEOs to actually take, uh, to do this. And I think we were very lucky for the second case where um, I think just through chances we were introduced through friends and, and the CEO, Amir, and he has a great track record and he was already very successful as an entrepreneur before who has done startup that was acquired and so on. And, um, and also the thing that he actually already was passionate about the space that we were in, the technology that we were developing, he was actually thinking even something similar in that domain. So he already had a very good understanding right. of the space. And his background, he has done a ton of enterprise sales in his prior startups. So his background is a great fit in terms of really actually helping to define the product market fit and also to take the product really to enterprise customers and really grow it. Yeah. And he's really excited, really passionate, and committed to take the technology you know, fully going forward. And so your involvement is still there as the technologist? Or so luckily, luckily also uh, my, uh, right, so another uh, Berkeley grad student, uh, we work together on this technology, and he actually has been the co-founder and chief architect of the technology. So, so and he's still at the company. And uh, so I think that really That's has helped. That's a great perspective. Uh, yeah, and well. Matei, for yourself, mm -hmm. you're still the chief technologist yeah. at Databricks. Mm -hmm. How was your, uh, and your uh, CEO is again internal, someone yeah. who was part of the additional mm -hmm. team. So how did you describe that experience, mainly in the context of the audience mm -hmm. who have, who are uh, faculty, some mm -hmm. of them might want to become entrepreneurs or even license their idea out or mm -hmm. to hire people to take their ideas to scale. Yeah, well, yeah, I think, uh, again, I think the reason to, uh, to do it yourself is if you have a vision for it that maybe only you can execute or can, can see. And it's really hard to, you know, get someone else to do it and especially also to hire someone uh, who's very good uh, to, to do that because, you know, maybe it hasn't been validated but you really believe in it. I think that's the reason to do it. Uh, my experience was a, a little different in a few ways. So one thing is I was just finishing my PhD, so I didn't have uh, you know my own research group at the time, so that made it easier to take some time off uh, completely and just work on the startup. And also we started with a bunch of co-founders actually from the same research group, including you know my two advisors and a, a lot of students and uh, Ali Godzi, who is the CEO now, who was a visiting researcher uh, working in distributed systems. So we already had a pretty uh, tight-knit team that had worked together for years and um, could, could work well together. Uh, we definitely learned a lot of stuff. Uh, we, we had some people on the team like Ali and uh, Jan uh, and Scott who had startup experience and we had others like me who didn't. Uh, uh, but we also had enough, I think, uh, you know, we had enough critical mass to build things and uh, to, to show promise of, uh, of our idea and to be able to hire the right people in the other roles at the company. Oh, wonderful. So then about raising money, which is related to this. So when uh, you're in the valley, but even then, so a lot of startups that we see are either business model innovations. These are the ones that maybe in the social space, there's no technical meat behind it. But for most people in this audience, these are, really strong technical contributions, papers in the top tier conferences. Do you think these kind of technical contributions help when going out to VCs to raise money? Is there, uh, do you see it making it easier for you to, to get into this space to, to, to kick off the startup process? And in particular, Don, I wanted to ask you, we've been hearing a lot of comments around, a lot of news articles around women finding it hard, women entrepreneurs finding it hard to raise money mm -hmm. in the Valley. Did you face any of that? Do you have any recommendations for uh, female faculty in the audience who would like to become entrepreneurs? 
both questions together, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's easier for female faculty because it's coming with a technical background and some suggestions that you might have. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I think uh, definitely, um, you know, like we do have an advantage that we are technologists, so we already have developed innovative technologies, and usually when we start a company, so in all three cases, they are all technologies that uh, me and my group has developed in my lab, and we see the potential, and then we are excited about the technology transfer, and then we decided to do the company. So in this case, unlike many you know, other entrepreneurs, we, when we go out, we actually already have uh, the initial technology um, that have already been developed. Um, so that, I think, definitely, both from fundraising perspective and also even from just building up the team, we already have a great team. And the, the core team all are really passionate and excited about the technology that we have been building in certain cases for years. Um, so I think that's a great start. That's um, like much, uh, you know, a greater start than many of the, uh, the other types of entrepreneurs. Uh, companies um, and as a women entrepreneur, I think um, so. First of all, uh, so we just uh, for Oasis Lab, we just raised uh, funding recently. We made the announcement. We raised 45 million. Congratulations! Um, yeah, thank you. And we also raised in a very short period of time, and we had uh, top of the line like great uh, mm -hmm. investors, including. Uh, Andreessen and uh, Excel and uh, many other awesome. uh, right, yeah. um, investors. And so for me, I think you, I did, I mean, it was a pretty smooth process. Uh, and also in particular, I think actually as a women entrepreneur, we do have uh, certain advantages too, in the sense that I actually have uh, you know, quite a few uh, friends who are women, uh, like VCs, uh, who run their funds. And also other, uh, even other, you know, uh, male uh, and, uh, VCs who run funds. Like there are a number of them who actually have strong, you know, intent and support for women entrepreneurs. That's very good. To uh, know. So in my fundraising, I think I have been lucky uh, that uh, yeah, people have the people that I have seen. They have been really supportive yeah. for women entrepreneurs. So female faculty, please reach out to Dawn for any recommendations of who to reach out to. <laughs> Yeah, happy so, to help. Yeah, and Matei, do you have? Did you have to do any fundraising yourself, or it's usually mm -hmm. the CEO who does it? How often oh, do you have I to mean, face I, the I, investors? Yeah, all all the co-founders were involved in it, especially at the beginning. I think, uh, but I think to you know, who pe to people who want to do it, I mean, I'll say a couple of things. So one thing is, anything you can do that shows validation of uh, your technology, as in someone would would actually buy it and or even use it, uh, is is super important. So you know, just having a paper at a top conference. They don't really know how to judge it. I mean, they'll be happy to grab coffee with you and talk because their job is to go talk to lots of interesting people in, in the technology space. But you know, they don't really know. But if, if you say, okay, there is someone using it, maybe someone in your university, maybe someone who used the open source thing and so on, uh, and they ask them and they find it solving a, a real problem, uh, that makes it a lot easier for them. Um, so for us, we had the open source you know, Spark software, and uh, it was very easy for the VC to see that it's useful because a lot of their portfolio companies were already using it because they were startups who try out kind of uh, crazy new technology. Uh, but that's that's what I would go for. Um, and uh, definitely, if you you know even if you don't know some some of the top VCs, you can I'm sure you know other faculty members who know them, and you can get an introduction through them. And I think that will also carry a lot of weight if someone they know says, "Oh, you got to talk to so and so because I think they have something interesting." So that's great feedback. So users are important. Do they have to be paying, or do they have to be? Do they have to at least have paying potential, or just demo? I think. Be fine? I think. Uh, well, they, I think it's good if they actually use it to, uh, to to do something valuable. And you could ask them, "Is this actually valuable to you?" They don't have to be paying, but they have to think it's it's useful. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Great feedback. Yeah. So yeah. So a follow up question, which uh, I think would be in the mind of many of the people in the audience, is: You guys are running successful startups right now. Both of them have raised quite a bit of money. How has any of this entrepreneurship affected your research career, positively and negatively, right? So both ways. Has, how has it made your research stronger or weaker? What, uh, 
your opinions. Don, you could start. You've gone through three times. And you're tenured. You have everything in your favor. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I mean, uh, in general, the answer, of course, is positive. Um, I think again, also people do do things differently, and there are different startups. Um, uh, there, I think, it's a very broad spectrum. Uh, so in my case, also because my research area is really broad, uh, the three startups they are actually in very different areas. The first one was in mobile security. The second one was in secure browsing. And then the third one is um, blockchain. So, um, and also overall, like my research is uh, and my research is fairly broad. So, not necessarily. I would say in my case, not necessarily the particular technical things that I learned from one company influence the next one. Because again, as I mentioned, I actually work in uh, different areas. Um, but what I would say is really the experience that I have gained through doing those startups. Um, that really, I think that's another reason that I actually enjoy doing startups is that I view it, uh, again, I think many of us here are growth-minded. Like we are here to really, to grow, to become better. And I think being a professor, uh, being a researcher, that's a great way for us to learn and grow. And on the other hand, being an entrepreneur, it's really, it's a great way to learn and grow. And it's very complementary to what we typically do as a researcher, as a faculty. And hence for that, I think in general, what I benefited from the entrepreneurship experience is that it really helped me to be stronger in this other dimension that normally we don't get to exercise our experience. And overall, that does help provide a broader perspective uh, when I then choose research topics or when I you know, work in uh, research and also in terms of um, also being more effective uh, yeah, no, well. because this is a pattern in the startups that you do. You start a new research team, get some publications out, do a startup, get it acquired or something, and then come back to another research, which is great, right? You're scaling up your research through startups. Uh, Matei, your response mm -hmm. to this, this question? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, being part of a startup has been uh, incredibly helpful in seeing uh, real world problems as they arise and basically finding new research areas that I know are important because I've experienced the problem or like our customers have experienced the problem, but that are uh, maybe harder for people to see or to even understand in, in academia. Some of them uh, you probably can't do at all unless you actually work with, uh, with customers. Um, so I mean, just a, a and, and these can be very general problems too. They're often not specific to a particular customer. So just as an example, Databricks uh, uh, sells only a cloud product. It's basically software as a service on Amazon Web Services or Azure. And the vast majority of the revenue is just licensing fees of using the software. It, you know, it's not support or consulting or anything. And so it's got to build a really good software as a service cloud product that's multi-tenant and uh, secure and performant and highly available. Uh, and building that is really hard. And this is actually the way the vast majority of new enterprise software today and even consumer software, software as a service. And I don't know any university class that teaches you how to build it. I don't see any papers at conferences that actually say, hey, here are the problems in terms of building it, or like here's a new abstraction that you can use to deploy SaaS or whatever. Um, and it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about. If, you, if, you know, if people are going to keep building computer systems in the future this way, we'd better understand how to do it. So a lot of the kind of you know, problems I think about in research are inspired by that, where I see, OK, something was super hard, like it literally took three years to get right uh, for Databricks. It's going to be hard for anyone else. Is there any way to make that easier? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, this is great. So, essentially, what you're saying is that both the startup experience is helping enrich your research career. And uh, so, I'll bring up the negative part of it. Okay, so <laughs> this is slightly controversial. Well, uh, but in a positive way, that uh, one of the questions I asked both Matei and Don internally was well, you it's a full-time job running a startup being in, uh, and doing, uh, being in academia. How do you manage it? And both of them were like, well, we spend 80% of the time doing a startup, 80% of the time doing academia. So that's their time. They'd have zero time. So my question here is more around how do you manage time for yourself, not about research or startups. What is your me time, and what do you do in your me time? And any tips for people who want to do both and still have a me time? Yeah. Don, why don't you start? 
Uh, um, that's a very good question. I wish there's a, there's a great answer to it because I asked the same question. Um, like I think especially, um, so for example, right now, uh, with the uh, Oasis Labs, we are growing very fast, and, uh, and there's, really, there's a lot of excitement, and uh, we are talking to actually a lot of potential customers and so on, and, and uh, there's just so much to do. And uh, right, the day is just not What do you do fun. outside of work? How do you relax? <laughs> um, so actually, um, uh, so earlier I was taking fencing um, lessons. Wow. That, that helps. helps. That helps even with me too. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 that's not for that. <laughs> I just figured uh, somehow I actually really enjoy no, the, uh, yeah, right, the the yeah. fencing uh, at at the sport. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on weekends, actually, I do go running on the beach when I when I can when that's I have funny. time. Yeah, Mate, any tips from your side? I know mm. it's even busier for you. Eight students. Uh, oh, managing the startup, <laughs> doing writing really I quality papers. You're being very prolific. I think Don has a lot of students too. Yeah, she has know. eight I students mean, as well. She fences with them, <laughs> 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 and they better yeah. lose. <laughs> what do you uh, do? I, I mean, my my feeling on this is even just a academic job alone, or just a startup job alone, can easily consume all your time. So, in a sense, you'd have the same problem in either case. And uh, you have to, in, in both cases, you have to, you know, be mindful of your time, understand, you know, what's the best way for you to spend stuff, when should you take time off, do something else, uh, when should you delegate, uh, when, you know, you should evaluate what you're doing, see, you know, is this actually the right way to spend my time, what's actually most important to spend time on. Um, so I think it's, it's not that different, but you do, you know, you have to expect that things will be somewhat hectic, and I think anyone who does either of these two jobs really enjoys them. Like, I don't think anyone starts, you know, a tenure track faculty job without enjoying that, yeah. uh, or a startup for yeah, that. Yeah, my matter. experience so, is the same in a research yeah. lab, and yeah. Donald's sitting here, I'm telling him as well. It's, we, yeah, we do it, we work extra hours, it's because we enjoy doing what we do with the latest yeah. Palm Beach project is about. We do it because we know eventually it'll help farmers, and that's why the entire team just works the extra hours, weekends, getting things up. This is great. So now going to another question, which is around both of you are very successful as entrepreneurs. And one is from Berkeley, the other is from Stanford, and you are from Berkeley as well. Yeah. Is there something <laughs> in the water of the Bay Area, or the scarcity of water in the Bay Area? Or is there something else that makes that schools there more successful? Are there things that other schools could learn, other than proximity to the VCs that are there? Is there something else? That, uh, that the university enables for faculty to do, uh, to do more startups or really scale up startups. Mm. Uh, so Don? Um, I think it's probably the biggest thing is uh, it's an ecosystem. Um, right, so in the Bay Area, I think there's a great ecosystem for doing um, uh, uh, startups. And also it's kind of the, I guess it's the mindset um, and the people that you interact with often uh, they are, uh, I guess, the concentration of uh, entrepreneur, you know, minded people probably is fairly high mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, uh, and of course it has a great setup. Uh, right, there's the density of VCs and 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 all that, and also yes, um, I think uh, uh, maybe there's also a little bit of a self selection. Uh, Among the VCs, you mean? Uh, I mean, even uh, I think again, like in the Bay Area, uh, people who like who go to the Bay Area, oh, maybe I see. they I've are also a little bit more self-selected. Right. Already. Matei, what uh, with Stanford, we see so mm -hmm. many of them. Mm -hmm. right? So what? Yeah, I think so. Berkeley, you see a lot too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I was from Berkeley as well. You have right. two yeah. Berkeley people up yes. here in, you in were terms a of startup. Person. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but the startup yeah, started startup from startup. there. So that's true. That's, true. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, being in the Bay Area is definitely good for connections and also for hiring people who've been at startups and so on. Uh, it does help with that. There are communities in other cities and other areas too, though, that can do it. So it can be done, but it definitely helps. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the other thing is having a supportive um, uh, department and department chair and so on. But I, I think most universities do want to see successful startups come out of it. But, uh, you know, you you want to make sure that they let you do it, that you're not penalized in some way. Uh, but 
I so think when you say support from the department, such as what? Well, so for example, you know, can you go on leave for some time to do it? Can you go on partial leave maybe? Because you, you have students, you want to continue uh, supporting them and doing research, these types of things. Sometimes it can be inflexible because of what, you know, policies or bureaucracy. Sometimes uh, they'll push through and make sure, you know, if they think it's impactful that, uh, that you can do it. Right. Um, I think many universities try to enable that. But, right, yeah. right. Yeah, a related question. So as big companies, as us here at Microsoft, how can we en enable more such successful entrepreneurs from various, uh, various universities, not just Berkeley and Stanford, but universities at other places as well? Would you have any suggestions on what companies like Microsoft can do? Don? <laughs> Uh, so first, of course, uh, give me more money. <laughs> but yeah. more money can also help. Um, and also, I think Microsoft, uh, is just, uh, uh, you know, any uh, uh, big company actually has a lot of advantages. Uh, has a lot of value that they can provide to future entrepreneurs, uh, to faculty who want to um, become entrepreneurs later. Um, so, for example, uh, Microsoft also sees a lot of problems, so it knows which problems are pain points for customers and which ones may have. A big market that actually need new technologies, and I think faculty and researchers are always always love to learn about mm -hmm. uh, these type of problems. Uh, and also, Microsoft has a great platform. If anyone uh, develops a new technology, Microsoft has this uh, offers a great platform that can introduce this technology to a lot of users and companies and so on. It can really help a new technology to uh, to be. Uh, to be adopted uh, and to, to grow, uh, mm. so I think that can that can be really helpful. And do you want to add something to that, Mitri? Um, yeah, I think beyond funding, which is definitely you know super important, both for research actually and the AIs, you know that you, you think are impactful, and for uh, for companies, I think um, Microsoft is interesting because it has wide reach into enterprises in pretty much any area. So anything, uh, you know, any sort of business partnerships with startups will be impactful. And I think those already exist in many areas of Microsoft. Maybe people don't know how to approach those or how to get one started, but uh, uh, they, they do make a difference early on and they can help you, you know, validate your idea and be good basically for both sides of the partnership. So how can Microsoft approach these? So both of you said it would be great if we reach out, but what is a good medium to reach out? to these entrepreneurs, to the startups? Is it through courses, students? Hmm. Do you have any suggestions? Or through some, like, how do we engage better with such budding startups? Other than maybe cool marketing events or things like that? Yeah. Hmm. But anyway, so yeah. while we're coming to the end of the time, just any parting thoughts on faculty here who might be thinking about taking their idea out and scaling it out through a startup? So Don? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think one is that um, I think entrepreneurship is something really fun to try. Uh, of course, it's also really, really hard when you do it. So it really takes a lot of time, and uh, it's uh, yeah, um, it's um, really you have to focus a lot on it. Um, and and also like not every I think people like do a, you know we all write many papers, but not every single paper is necessarily something that you may want to turn into a startup. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, for a startup, we want um, technology that's both innovative, so that gives you an edge, and also it needs to be really practical enough that actually can be used in the real world. So many papers that we write about, uh, it has new ideas, it really, uh, really cool ideas, but it may still be at the very early stage that's not practical enough yet, so those are probably not ready for doing a startup yet. And also the third is that I need to really solve a big enough problem that people are willing to pay for it and has a big enough market. And, uh, and I think as faculty and researchers who are looking at uh, starting their company, are trying to see which technology that they have developed, they may want to take uh, you know, into the market. That's something uh, helpful to keep in mind. Okay, and Matej, from your side? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the reasons to, uh, to, to do it are basically impact and uh, also ability to work on problems that maybe would be harder to work on in academia. So uh, these, are, these are both good reasons to do it. Uh, it. It is a lot of work, as Don said, and it's a, it's a large commitment. And you know, you, it, it will take more time than you expect. Even if you take just a little bit of time, you know, sabbatical, whatever, and then you want to go back, you, if things are going well, you'll want to continue being involved, and there'll be a lot of things you can do. Um, so it is, it is a somewhat uh, large commitment. Uh, but on the other hand, you can really see things that you wouldn't see outside, and especially um, if you you find a good team and you have you know investors or partners who can help get things started they can accelerate that because you know it's also their job uh, to help you make those uh, connections and, and get those other users yeah yeah thank you thank you Matei and Don and we'll be all in the bus for dinner feel free to ask us questions hope you all enjoyed this session if you have any more questions we love to carry on the discussion over dinner thank you everyone thank you, thank you. and Sandy